Welcome to the DCC Museum. On September 25th, we received word that David Hill has lost his battle with cancer. David was important to the DCC community and to museum, as his experience with Tapematic back in the day was super important to receive all that information, what had happened during that time. We met David in 2017 and he was pragmatic, enthusiastic and charming and his was the first interview that we put on film. He not only shared his stories but many of the materials that he collected over the past decades, among them this DCC 900 that he willingly signed for us. Rather than showing you just the clips, we now will be able to share the full 40 minute interview that we did in 2017. Right, so, okay, so today we are here with uh, David Hill, Tate Maddox. Hi. So, um, we, David, what we, uh, we, we, I've mailed you these, these questions, so you've, um, you've, uh, you've read them. And um, what we would like to know in this uh, documentary uh, that we're shooting for, for DCC, is like, mm -hmm. you know, why it... Um, started why it never became a success you know and there are very few people out there that actually know what you know and you're so specific uh, regarding your knowledge to the tape itself right and uh, Philips had um, big problems with production they weren't ready in 90 they weren't ready in 91 so at some point uh, what was your first introduction with with DCC when was the first time you ever heard the word DCC when when you got approached you well, Philips contacted us because they needed uh, to be able to manufacture the DCC cassettes commercially. And uh, we had uh, the, the, the market share for manufacturing cassettes. One of the problems with DCC is that the tape had to be wound on the left-hand side. And the reason for that is because when you manufactured an audio cassette, it wasn't that important which side the actual spool was wound to because for example if it was wound to the right which was the normal process when the cassette left the machine turning the cassette over it was automatically queued up for side one to play first but with the DCC cassette to be able to queue it up we had to wind on the left hand side of the cassette so we had to redesign our machinery to manufacture DCC and it was attractive at the time because it was the end of the analog cassette in in concept and um, and the DCC was the future and Philips were willing to help sponsor that change in terms of uh, I mean of course they they offered to buy a lot of machinery and but they um, actually paid for for uh, you reinventing the 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 the, the, the tape Maddox machine. They didn't pay for the R and D, but okay. uh, of course they'd already signed up a lot of our existing customers mm -hmm. to manufacture DCC, and we knew that we would sell machines to them. So because they had to uh, produce the DCC. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so that describes a little bit of what was your first impression when you when you when you when you saw it. When you heard about the idea, what, what Philips is trying to... Personally? Of course, yeah, personally. Mm. Personally, um, there was already the CD prominent in the marketplace. There was also the mini disc that had had some teething troubles with the compression and how it worked. Um, the problem for me is that I didn't quite understand, personally, where DCC would fill the void, because... Um, because there was lots of limitations. Of course, there was the backwards compatibility to go back to the analog cassettes that was heavily publicized at the time. There was also the problem of, um, of, 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 of instant search, the convenience factor, where, where, where people would flip, flip between tracks. Uh, mm. I wasn't completely sold on it, but um, you know they had a lot of people that were involved with Philips who had a lot of enthusiasm for the for the format and and to be honest it was a great format in terms of sound quality but 
I wasn't convinced that it would work personally. Okay, so at that point you decided, okay, because we were, you were going to be able to sell this amount because you knew that it, uh, it would lead to sales of the machines, that it would at least on short term would be a success for Tapematic. Yeah, we're the, we were the only company that was manufacturing machinery to manufacture DCC cassettes. Interesting. I did not. I did not know that. Mm. Okay. So, um, and what was the specific uh, question and task that you were approached with? Because at some point you told me, I um, that you had some say into the design or the or the, the the shell even that something had to be redesigned. Is, is that true, or was the complete shell already designed? Was the DCC ready when it came to you? Well, it was it was ready. I mean, of course, Philips had to alter certain things in relation to making it um, compatible to be manufactured uh, in, in, in bulk commercially. Mm -hmm. um, as, as I explained, one of the, the major problems is that the cassette had to be wound as a left-hand machine. Mm -hmm. So the spool had to be on the left-hand side so that when the cassette was finished being wound, it was taken off the machine, it was put into a player, and immediately side one would start mm -hmm. as such. Okay. Because that's that's something that we we'd never experienced before, mm -hmm. and so we actually stopped production of our standard machine, and we started production of what we considered to be a, a DCC machine, which we called the two thousand two CL, CL meaning left hand, mm -hmm. you know, cassette left hand wonder. Um, the strangest thing was is that people who um, who then were who were manufacturing still analog cassette, who were being forced to buy the CL machine, were not happy about it because it, it, it really didn't feel right to them. Okay. And so so they were they were quite reluctant to buy that machine because it Because it, they were used to the right hand loader? Load? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, and not only that, but there was other things like for example, because of the tape that was being used and had to be used to manufacture the DCC cassette. It was very delicate, so with it, there were certain handling characteristics, such as bearings and air guides and things like that, that were specific to handling that type of tape that made the machine a lot more complex. Okay, so different maintenance, more maintenance maybe? Uh, certainly more maintenance, but just, just the general working with the machine. Mm -hmm. In fact, the interesting part about it is, is that when we as a company established that DCC was not going to work because we worked out that, that Philips were really going to pull the plug on it, we actually went back to manufacturing the CR machine and continued to manufacture the CR machine and sold them as new machines till the end of our, our involvement in, in audio cassette. What um, this is uh, uh, an inter interesting topic. Uh, what year was that uh, that you that Tapematic uh, realized? Okay, th th Philips at some point is going to pull the plug. I th I think we're looking at ninety five, ninety six. Okay, because ninety six they they did uh, pull the plug. Yeah, but, but, uh, okay. ninety five, okay. ninety six. But okay. they sold a lot of machinery to mm -hmm. customers of ours, existing customers, mm -hmm. and and the proviso for those customers were, was that they could continue to use the same machine to manufacture normal analog compact cassette if they needed to. So it wasn't a, it wasn't a, a, a waste of an investment because they could manufacture DCC or analog cassettes on yeah. the same machines. Okay. Okay. I actually ended up working at a company in London, a little independent company, that was manufacturing uh, vinyl predominantly and uh, upstairs they had a facility to manufacture 8-track cartridges and cassette, which was the new music of the 80s, you know, that was 1979. And, um, <coughs> and I got involved in the cassette side of things, and I worked there for an awful long time, it seemed, but it was actually only probably two or three years. And I was the junior engineer who, who manufactured and looked after the machines that manufactured um, cassettes and um, and I, I, and eight track cartridges. Eight track cartridges, you know. I mean, forget about vinyl, but eight track cartridges was an art form. You know, graphite backed c tape <coughs> that actually um, had to be assembled and then put into what we call toasters. 
toasters were banks of of of, of drives that drove eight track cartridges and the idea is after the cartridge was manufactured and it was it was a very manual task um, they would splice them together the girls with a with a a, a, a metal splicing tape and then they would put them in these toasters overnight and the toasters would just run the tapes continually to spread the graphite lubricant within the tape so that then they'd take them out in the morning and then they'd be able to pack them and label them and oh wow them out. that's a very time consuming process then yeah eight track cartridges were crazy wow. crazy oh, but wow. then then there was the cassette that followed on <coughs> and cassette was a, a a great business for everybody you know because it was the growing business and and this being at this conference today is is you know it, it kind of rekindles those memories because it was a very bittersweet experience perhaps looking at it now because the very fact of the the success of cassette um was was um uh, responsible for the demise of vinyl because cassette was the convenient medium it was small, you could record on it, yeah, yeah. And you could carry it around yeah. and, and so on and so forth. So, so you know, um, Philips at the time, you know, I remember at the time, uh, you know, at the start of CD, they considered um, CD as we know it to be a completely trivial pursuit. They were not interested in, in getting involved in um, a medium for audio a digital medium for audio. They had uh, the, the, the video disc and uh, that was deliberately copied over from the, the, the LP. So it was 12 inch, it was a big disc and da da da. da. And so the original idea of them to, um, to go into the CD, if we can call it that, was a seven inch disc. And that was crazy, you know, because, you know, I remember the conversations at the time. It's like, who wants to carry around a seven inch single? It's stupid. It doesn't make any sense. Um, and then they, they, they reinvented the idea um, and they originally used the, uh, the, the, the size of the compact cassette as being their, um, as being their model. So they used the diagonal size of the cassette, which is 115 millimeters, to then produce a disc, which was 115 millimeters in diameter. But unfortunately, they couldn't get the equivalent of a full album onto 115 millimeters because 115 millimeters would only hold 600 megabytes of information and they didn't have those compression technologies at that time and they realized that to, to be able to get the equivalent of a full album onto a CD it would have to be 120 millimeters so they increased the size from the diagonal size of a cassette and you can check it it's probably the same for DCC 115 millimeters to 120 millimeters and they could get 650 megabytes on that and that was enough for them to get a full album, album with the quality onto, yeah. yeah onto onto a cd and that's why the cd is 120 millimeters wow. hey, when, and 1.2 millimeters thick just so when when philips approached um um thematic in uh, what was your um specific role what was your function at that very moment um uh, well, I was involved in the R&D team um, in, in many areas, you know, listening, commenting. At the end of the day, though, I suppose it was like, here's Philips as a customer. They want us to produce a winder to, to wind these strange tapes on the left-hand side. And, uh, you know, it was a commercial, like, OK, fine, yeah. if you want to do that. Because you've got to remember, at that stage... We didn't know whether DCC would be successful or not successful or how the market would accept it because it was a totally new project. Mm -hmm. You've got to remember there was lots, there was so many things going on at the time. There was, there was Minidisc and there was also another company called Dataplay, which was a company that was manufacturing this tiny little 
CD drive, if you want to call it that, almost like a floppy disk that was designed for music. I don't know, I, I'm not even convinced they actually had something that worked, but mm -hmm. there was lots of people trying to miniaturize the format of, of audio music as such. What was the, um, the time frame between the, the approach and that you were ready to fulfill uh, what Philips fast, did? Fast, fast, really fast, you know, even like six months. From being approached to actually yeah. having the tape uh, left yeah. load already. Yeah, and the the, wow. the the reason for that is because we, uh, I mean, we had the market share of, mm -hmm. of audio cassette tape tailoring. And tape tailoring it? is an interesting term, tape tailoring. Um, but also, we manufacture everything in house, so we didn't have to rely on third-party contra contractors to be able to supply us what we needed. We could practically design a mirror machine overnight. And so was, that, was that contact strictly between UK and Eindhoven, the Netherlands? or No, it was, it was directly between Milan, the head office, and Eindhoven. But you were based in the UK at that, uh, at that, at that point? Yeah, but my involvement was, um, was, was global. You know, I, I covered the UK, but I was working directly with Milan on an everyday basis. Mm -hmm. you know, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? Do you remember of any uh, problems that you were or were not able to solve in, the, in this six months uh, process? Or was it uh, because that's reasonably fast six months to go from, from uh, to because it was different tape? No, no, no problems. Uh, I mean, the, you, you've got to remember that. It, it wasn't so much a big problem because uh, at that time we were already manufacturing the 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 machinery for um, manufacturing video cassettes, VHS video cassettes, um, and and umatic video cassettes. So the handling of the type of tape that was being required um, to manufacture DCC was something we were already used to doing. So we knew what we had to do in relation to special guides to hold the tape. Um, it, it wasn't hard at all. It was literally a, a, an exercise in reversing and making a mirror image of the machine we already had, um, as well as um, certain little, little parts of the machine, like the, the control chamber and stuff like that so that we could handle it in a slightly different way. But in fact, that those modifications then, uh, I said earlier, when we understood that DCC wasn't a, a, a format that was going to be accepted well, um, but analog cassette was still continuing, and people were asking for the old format of a right-hand loader. Um, we actually used some of those um, innovations in the, the the new CR machine, you know, for tape handling. Because I mean, it was a, it so was it, a it gave you a version two, basically, of the of the kind CR of, machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah certain yeah. certain little things. Yeah. yeah. Was the um, uh, you have been quoted um, quite a few times. We have a, a, a researcher that that did a lot of investigative work for us, and God you've help been, us. well. It, the interesting was that you had. Um, seemingly in, in, in sort of an infatuation with, with analog uh, tapes, uh, apparently quoted. So was, it, was, was the, the DCC experience then bittersweet? Because it, it sort of meant to say goodbye to the analog tape. And it was only a, a backward compatible in, in a playing device. Uh, Philips uh, attacked the analog cassette by basically uh, trying to wipe it out and, and, and uh, replacing the three billion cassette year market? No, I don't think so. Uh, I, I, I think that, you know, I, I think we're all realists in many respects. We knew that, you know, the, the cassette had a life and it was a life expectancy that was quite obvious. You know, uh, the CD was, was, was taking the market completely. Um, one of the guys that worked for us, um, Mr. Bernard, Bernardini, was um was by that time he, he was he was getting on in life he was quite quite elderly um he was the guy that worked on our recording side um for um analog 
And um, it was interesting because he was one of the guys that was an apprentice to the guy that invented magnetic recording at uh, AEG Telefunken with the magnetophone. And we, we actually had a, 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 an outlook on life. We, we'd done a lot of research and development in relation to the analog cassette. Um, we were using video amplifiers for, for high-speed duplication, which had 300 megahertz bandwidth. And, um, and we'd done exceedingly well at producing a, 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 a commercial slave recorder uh, for manufacturing analog audio cassettes that was um, was quite unique. I mean, we had fantastic uh, noise, signal to noise ratios and frequency response that uh, was unheard of in the business. But in spite of all of these achievements, uh, uh, I mean, we, you've got to remember that we as Tate Manic invented and developed the solid state digital loop bin. You know, it was our invention. There was nothing before it. We, we made the very first. We called it SAM, as in Static Audio Master, but we always used the Play It Again SAM. <laughs> Play It Again SAM. But it, was, it, digi Sam. it was digital. It was digital, yeah. 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 And, and, you know, that, that was a, a unique moment because, mm. uh, you know, we sold an awful lot of those machines to people who had existing uh, installations for manufacturing analog cassette. Uh, the analog... The analog cassette was on its last legs. We knew that it was going to end. Um, for us, the digital compact cassette was um, was interesting because you know, for us to continue to be able to supply machines, mm -hmm. machines to to enable the 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 manufacture of cassette in whatever format was uh, was a great idea, and it, it wasn't a problem for us in terms of. What is also interesting, well, and what you're saying is that uh, it has been um, noted that part of the reason why DCC didn't become a success is because the analog didn't die. It didn't want to die. It kept on for many years longer uh, than, than it was expected to, to, to be. Um, you even said you started rebuilding the, the right-hand loader machines again because yeah. the, that demand still continued on with billions of, uh, of tapes being, uh, being produced. Yes, it did. And I, and I think... You know, you, you have to look, you know, I've, I've lived through so many different formats and seen the rise and fall of formats, you know, and, and the cassette was a fantastic format because it, it had great longevity in terms of, um, you know, if you compare that to something like the, the DVD or the Blu-ray, you know, those formats peaked in five years or less, you know. I mean, once the studios released all their back catalogues as, uh, as they could, and then it's gone. The cassette went forever. You know, it was like it was in in the process for like 30 years, I think, you know, from the original design stage. Um, it was a great format because, you know, my mum had a cassette player and she could buy a cassette and she could put it in a cassette player and she'd press one button and it would play music. I think the problem is, is that with DCC, that wasn't possible anymore. You know, she couldn't, she wouldn't even know what a DCC was. You know, it was, it was this new technology. And I personally never quite understood because there was already the Philips compact disc. Why would anybody want to go out and buy a cassette that would require them to go out and buy a new player to be able to play something that was inferior in many respects, and I'm talking about many ergonomic respects, to the CD. Mm -hmm. What was the point? Except for being able to continue to play their old collection of analog cassettes. But then if they had an old collection of analog cassettes, they already had an old analog cassette player in the house, in their car. Why would they want to go and invest in another player? As such, I did, I've never quite understood that. I never quite understood that. Were you impressed with the with the audio quality when you heard the, the DCC versus the, the analog cassette? Yeah, I mean, uh, but was I impressed with it? Was it better than a CD? No, it was just did digital you... quality on a cassette. 
mm-hmm. without without the ability to be able to instantly skip tracks or you know I, I never quite understood it was a good idea but I mean it was great in terms of technology but it was so complex the head was very delicate and I think one of the major problems that Phillips had is that they had this um, it was almost a compulsion to make it backwards compatible so that the the actual player the DCC player as such could also play analog cassettes and I think that was a a huge mistake because the problem was is that a lot of those those old analog cassettes were actually damaging the playback head of the DCC to the point that the DCC couldn't be used anymore because the yeah. playing the analog cassettes was actually damaging the head because it was so delicate. The thin film I had, and, oh, and you had no way of uh, of cleaning the heads because you couldn't get inside uh, the recorder. Couldn't yeah. get inside it, couldn't clean them. I uh, uh, forget about cleaning it or damaging it. Just the amount of dirt and dust that had accumulated on old analog cassettes was actually um, uh, producing so much dirt and residue on the actual head that you know. Every time you played an analog cassette, it meant that you couldn't play the DCC anymore unless you took it apart and cleaned everything. It was a, it was crazy. Did the um, the, the design of the, the tapes and the the machine stay the same over the years ninety two till ninety ninety six at the Tapematic? For us, yeah, was there improvement, technical improvements, or was it uh, after six months did it stay did it stay the same no, for all no, those years? There, there was no need for us to improve anything. You know, okay. we, we we produced. We produced the machines that would make DCC cassettes. A lot of our customers would buy those machines. Um, they didn't buy many. They bought perhaps two or three machines, you know, because a lot of them invested in the DCC idea future mm-hmm. and the and, and and you know with the basis that they could. If everything went wrong, they could still use the same machine to manufacture standard analog cassettes. So, you know, they didn't mind very much. Okay. Know. Do you know how many uh, machines Tapematic uh, produced for DCC reproduction? Do you know what? I, I don't, but I'm guessing probably no more than 200, 100 maybe. I don't know. Worldwide? Yeah. Mm hmm. You've got to remember that we were producing thousands of winders a year. So for the period that DCC existed, it was almost like at the end of this huge demand for analog loaders. And then suddenly there was a resurgence of demand because people were buying loaders to be able to manufacture DCC. And so it sort of peaked for a little while and then went down again, mm-hmm. you know. Um, the production of DCC at Tapematic was, was different because it had to be done in, the, in, in a new clean environment. Uh, no. It didn't, did not? You've got to remember, we produced the machines. Mm-hmm. We then sold them to people who would then use them to produce the DCCs. Mm-hmm. We had no control over how, how, they, they, how they were going to be or where they use them. Mm-hmm. But as far as I'm concerned, the DCC machines were designed to be worked in a, a, a room that was clean rather than a clean room. Mm-hmm. Um, how, how that was stipulated by Philips, I can't comment on, but I can tell you absolutely 100% that the people that bought the DCC machines and the people that actually manufactured the DCC cassettes, as far as I'm concerned, were not using them in a clean room environment. They might have been using them in a room that was clean, Mm -hmm. but not a specific Class 1000 clean room. No. Okay. Which is something we knew a lot about because uh, at that particular time, you've got to remember that that the manufacture of uh, video cassettes had to be done in a clean room environment. Absolutely, 100%.
Did you, at the, at the end of the period, consider it, uh, that it was a success for TapeMap financially? Or was it uh, considered a break-even, disaster? How, how would you see that? It's a strange question in many respects. Um, and, and the answer is a difficult answer. Um, it was a success in as much as suddenly we had this demand to supply an extra few hundred machines, let's say, at a period in our manufacturing history that we considered the cassette, the analog cassette, to be d a dying format, you know, so the actual production levels levels had, had reduced. So suddenly to have an order for another 300 machines from all different companies around the world was great, yeah, I suppose. But we continued afterwards to manufacture machines for analog cassettes anyway. So I, I, I don't know. I, I, I think it was, I think in, in actual fact, it was such small numbers in the whole picture of things that it was probably not that significant as a, a, an investment. I, I, we certainly didn't lose money on it in terms of it wasn't that difficult for us to produce the machine. Mm -hmm, because you, you were able to, to build it within six months. It didn't take that much of yeah. your R&D development. I think, I think one of the major problems also for, for DCC was that originally the compact cassette, the success attached to the compact cassette was because Sony, ironically, petitioned Philips to make the, the compact cassette royalty free. Um, and, and that's quite a statement for a company like Sony, because Sony don't do anything for free. And suddenly for them to sort of agree to, um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, for them to get Philips to agree to release that format royalty free to make it a success was, was significant. I don't think it was quite the same with DCC. I think there were lots of, 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 of um, royalty attachments to it. So people that agreed to even invest in manufacturing it had to sign a lot of agreements to pay royalty and pay. Uh, so I think that stifled it somewhat also. Do you think uh, management wise, upper management was uh, that expectations uh, were met? Was there a forecast on how successful DCC was going to be for Pigmatic? I don't think it was discussed at that level. I think okay. it was a, well, here's a new format. It was talked about for a long time. Um, it was at the same time that other formats were being released. Um, you know, if DCC could have been successful, um, you know, we were up against the competition. We weren't in a position at the time to manufacture a machine to make mini disc, So we had no option. You know, it, it, we, either, we either manufactured the machinery to manufacture DCC or nothing. <laughs> so it was a it was a no brainer really for us to get into the DCC business, um, especially as our machines could also be used to man manufacture analog cassettes. It was a no brainer. Okay, so you've owned uh, um, a DCC uh, um, machine that you've donated uh, to the museum as well as some cassette yeah. cassettes. Yeah. Did one uh, one machine ever make it to your? I know you're sort of an audiophile. You yeah, yeah. Did, did it was one the top make... of my pile. I, it was the one thing that I went to every time I came home at night. <laughs> no. no, it didn't, right? No, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. So, uh, so it, it never made it into your living room. No. Did you have a regular analog cassette? Yeah, but I didn't use that very much either. Okay. I still have cassette players, actually, and I, I love them. I love the whole concept of, of cassette from the, the very first day. You know, um, would DCC ever make it into my living room? Um, yeah, I appreciate the, the sonic quali qualities of music, very much so. You know, I listen to music, and uh, you know, it matters to me that it's it's good quality. I mean, cassette for me, oh, sorry, analog cassette for me, was noisy, and uh, you know, in fact, I would always prefer to listen to a vinyl record than I would a cassette, 
because uh, clicks and pops were one thing, but you know the the, the hiss and the the noise floor and saturation at high levels of you know always used to bug me because um, I suppose. I suppose I'm a little bit of a perfectionist in many respects. Um, DCC would have fixed all of those problems, but as I, I mentioned earlier, you know, what was the point? I already had CD. Okay. Um, I mean, this is this is great stuff. What I uh, what I if if you can. Um, Tell me the uh, anecdote about the nicknames for. Uh, can you tell me the anecdote, the nicknames for DCC that you um, that internally were used between you and your uh, your, your your colleagues? I mean, Phillips. Please no, you, you had the what, DCC, what, the Dutch crappy cassette, yeah, 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 and the, well, uh, Phillip, the, the, the didn't Phillip, consult Phillip, consumers. Phillip, Phillip, Phillips. We all said the best the best thing that Phillips ever owned was the relationship with Sony. <laughs> 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 they were absolutely, you know, I mean, it was fantastic. We we used to call them Phillips. Phillips. <laughs> Phillips. Um, you know, and but Philip, Phillips is a very big company, and I, I really don't want them to send a hitman out to kill me at this stage in the game. Um, <laughs> You're too accomplished right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, Phillips was... Uh, sorry, Phillips is a great company. They have the most fantastic ideas and they have a team of people there that invent some fantastic things. And, uh, and I admire them for that immensely in every way, shape and form. You know, they have a, a, a great team of people. I think the problem is, is that they, at that particular time, had a format that they knew was dying, you know. Um, not that it would have bothered them because they weren't making any money out of it anyway because they'd already handed over the, the, the royalty right um, for free. Um, and they saw it suddenly as an opportunity to be able to suddenly make some money out of the cassette um, by, by, by calling it a DCC. Um, we, we always used to say, you know, that, that DCC stood for Originally, it was uh, didn't consult the consumer because, um, you know, because they, they should have asked the consumers what they wanted, you know, how much convenience. Because it wasn't like the consumer could go out and buy a DCC cassette and play it in their car, for example. They wouldn't be able to do that. They would have had to have a player in their car to play DCC and analog cassettes, which we've proven now would never have worked. Um, so they didn't consult the consumer. Um, and, and a lot of people became very frustrated with it. So we, yeah, unfortunately, we, we did used to call it the Dutch crappy cassette. Um, uh, Philips, they done their very best at marketing it. Marketing for Philips was never their strongest point. <laughs> you know, they, they, you know, I think if uh, if other people had taken it on board, I mean, you know, the thing that that didn't exist at the time is that rather than Philips produce uh, a Walkman, they should have got Sony to produce a Walkman, like what they did in the beginning with the analog cassette. Unfortunately, this time round, they had a huge problem. And that is that Sony wouldn't produce a Walkman because they had this little thing called a mini disc player, which was fast, it was slick, it had instant track selection, and that's what people wanted. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much. This was uh, this was excellent. It was this was awesome. These were the answers we were we were hoping for. Thank you. You got enough. I got, I got, right. I got plenty. Okay, I got one. plenty. <sighs> yeah. Or there's this little disc that is this size, and it's like tiny, and you can put it in, and you can.
press play and if you didn't like that track you could go next and it would go to the next track. What one would you buy today? I, I, I think the problem is is that by that time CD had gained such a hold on the market that I mean I, I don't think it really mattered what somebody come up with they would have still failed. DCC, data play, mini disc which went for longer than we ever expected it to. If they'd have released that five years earlier it probably would have established a great foothold in the market you know a digital cassette format but it was five years too late simple as that yeah. okay i'm glad i put the camera back on because that that is a great quote it's five years too oh, late. oh you're basically. recording still yeah <laughs> the, the idea was good it's just five years too late i never even said fuck <laughs> <laughs> john cleese did and if you in a funeral right the first time Every, anybody ever said fuck yeah, at a funeral yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like awesome, awesome. We'll, we'll I actually, I up. actually, I actually, I'm at the age now, you know, where I used to, I used to, you know, when I was younger, I would always go to weddings, you know, and you know, and I, I'd go to weddings, and and you know, there'd be the grandmothers and the aunties and all that, and they'd come up to me, you know, and they'd go, "You're next, you're next, you're next." I'm now at the age where I tend to go to funerals a lot. <laughs> You know, and the same people are there. So you're I next. actually go you're up next. to them and you're next. <laughs> <laughs> it's payback. <laughs> yeah, it's payback. Yeah. Okay, stop the fucking recording. Yeah. <laughs>